many questions that kept on um, evolving after the previous thing and I could see the, the speaker was just really so generous and just keeping going and everyone was really wrapped. It's probably the most I've learned in a short space of time in the last year or so. his smile he has just this amazing smile that carries this incredible energy and it's really infectious yeah for, in some ways for me it wasn't so much what he said but more his very presence that really had a big impact on me I think I've come across people like that in stories and in films before, but I've never come across someone like that in real life. And so it was really an honour to be in an audience um, uh, for a speaker like that. I'd really say that Vader London has this fantastic ability of bringing people from different walks of life together. You've got all these amazing people, whether they're professionals, whether they're artists, whether they're designers. It's really marrying together this amazing world of music, drama, philosophy. And I'd say just come along, experience it. If you like it, keep coming back and I'm sure you will. Incredible. Enlightening. Inspiring. Rejuvenating. Friendly and inspirational. Or soul searching. Colourful. Very spiritual. Inspirational. Fun, entertaining and enlightening. Come back soon. <laughs>
कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमथे भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नीति नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवानी प्रचारिने निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पश्चात्यते शतारिने श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर शिवासदी को भक्त बृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे very grateful and honored to be with all of you this evening thank you for being here and thank you for Ernst and Young EY for hosting this auspicious event the subject of tonight is life without borders Often, oftentimes this refers to using our imagination, thinking out of the box, seeing the invisible, trying to do the impossible, overcoming obstacles, even when we're not really given much encouragement anywhere. But from a spiritual perspective and a moral perspective, We've seen people who thought out of the box and who really accomplished things unbelievable beyond any expectations, who were tyrants, who were filled with greed, who caused economic collapse, genocide, and so much pain. So when we're Thinking about life beyond borders, it is very important. Thank you. <clears throat> that along with external determination, enthusiasm, there's internal transformation. Otherwise, our accomplished wish will never bring us any true fulfillment and will not help us to be instruments of positive change in the world. <clears throat> After all, many of the worst calamities of the world today are being created by people with very high education, a lot of wealth, an incredible imagination. We're celebrating Diwali. It's a festival that focuses on this principle. Victory of good over evil, light over darkness, knowledge over ignorance but it especially focuses on the need for inner transformation. Greed into generosity, transforming selfishness into selfless service. Arrogance into humility, hate into love. Interestingly, Diwali takes place on Amavasya, which is the darkest night of the month. Some people call it the no moon, some people call it the new moon, because there's just no moon that night. 
Now, people living in the cities don't much know the difference. But if you're actually living in a place where there's not all these lights around, and you don't have a flashlight, it makes all the difference in the world whether there's a moon or not. When I was younger, I used to have to climb up and down a mountain at night. It was a three-mile walk. And on full moons, everything could be seen. And on the Amavasya, it was absolutely pitch dark. In darkness, you don't know if there's snakes in front of you, if there's ditches in front of you. You're blind. Your eyes have no function in darkness. And naturally in darkness there's fear. Amavasya is the darkest night. And it's also considered in the Indian traditions to be the most inauspicious or unlucky night. But Diwali is a day, it's the night of light and auspiciousness. Where people light candles or lamps on their rooftops, in their doorsteps, on the roads, on the banks of rivers. It's the lightest night of the year without a moon. It's transformation. Light is life. The sun is the source of light. We cannot live for a moment without the light and the heat of the sun. And in many ways, understanding this principle, we can conceive that whatever particular status of society or race or sex or social condition, <clears throat> we all depend on nature equally. Whether one, was, whether one is a billionaire or a little Swami like me who hasn't had a bank account since 1969. We're all depending on the same sun whether we're from Pakistan or India, whether we're from Palestine or Israel, whether we're from America or Russia, we all depend totally on the same sun, the light and heat. Whoever we are, we are totally helpless without that higher power of light. Diwali is recognizing that recognizing a higher power that personally and collectively we are all dependent on and being grateful to that higher power. And to actually be grateful to that higher power means to respect the quality of life everywhere wherever it is manifesting. Diwali is a very special time. Much like Christmas or Hanukkah, it's a time of lights. It's a time of giving gifts. It's a time of feeling charitable. It's a time of sharing because that's the very basis of what the light and goodness is. It's a time of the year when we really focus on bringing light into our own minds, our own hearts, and being an instrument of that light in whatever we do. The history of Diwali has many lessons as well. In Ramayan, it is explained 
after Ram and Sita and Lakshman were in exile for 14 years. They returned to their city of Ayodhya. Everyone loved them more than their own life. According to the Vedas, Lord Ramchandra is an avatar, an incarnation of the one Supreme God, who appeared on this earth to teach by example. And he came with Sita, the supreme feminine aspect of God. Together, they passed through inconceivable difficulties with integrity, with values, with compassion. And because of their goodness, because they saw everybody and respected everybody with equal vision, everyone loved them. The place that they ruled there was practically no crime, there was no poverty, because people lived with compassion. Why? Because their leaders lived with compassion. Nothing could corrupt them, and therefore practically nothing could corrupt their citizens. But how did that happen? When they were very young, just married, Ram, by very um, unfair, envious, fearful manipulation, he was exiled to the forest for 14 years. He didn't have to go. He could have fought and won. But because the honor of his father was at stake, he chose to go. Because he was grateful to his father. To be grateful to someone, to honor someone, is not just according to what makes us happy. It's something that has to have deep substance. And that substance may be tested to see if it's actually genuine. For the integrity of his father and for high moral principles, he accepted the exile. <coughs> Sita, his wife, demanded that she go with him. He refused. <clears throat> he said, impossible, Sita, you cannot come. You are a princess. You were born and raised in beautiful palaces. If you come with me, you'll have to live in the forest with bitter, cold winters and burning hot summers and sleep on the hard ground. All your life you have slept on beautiful silken sheets on soft beds. You've eaten the finest foods cooked by the greatest chefs. If you come with me, you'll just be digging in the ground for raw roots and looking for some fruits or berries to eat. You are living in the highest security. If you come with me, you'll be sleeping under trees where there's lions and there's tigers and there's leopards and there's poisonous snakes and there's all kinds of dacoits or criminal people living in the jungles. You're wearing the most comfortable clothing in the forest you'll have to wear a dress of tree bark. <coughs> you cannot go. She said, I will go. He said, you will not go. There's pages of the Ramayan of this argument. 
And ultimately, Sita said, when I married you, my father, Janak, he made a promise that through success or failure, victory or defeat, through good times or hard times, I would be at your side. That's what it means to me to be faithful. You cannot make my father a liar. I am coming with you. Ram said, please come. That's the faithfulness of their relationship. Sita told Ram to, to not be at your side with you. Even living in this heaven of Ayodhya would be like hell. But to perform my duties with affection, even in a hellish condition, would be sweeter than heaven. What's pleasure? That's what we're being taught through this example. Pleasure is something of the heart. Things can give some degree of satisfaction to the mind and senses, but nothing, no thing, can give any gratification to the heart. Only to love and be loved can give satisfaction to the heart. Unfortunately, we are so distracted to things that we compromise the integrity and values that make our life meaningful. In my 65 years of living in this world, I have never, ever seen anyone who was loved because of their money, because of their position, because of their title in a corporation or in politics, because of their skills. Nobody loves you for that. People may respect. People may enjoy according to what they get out of it. And most of the time, people are envious. But when we're compassionate, when we have values, when we have learned how to love others, people love us. What's really valuable in life? To love and be loved or just to accumulate? The evolution of humanity is going from the obsessive need to get things to the joy of giving with love, with compassion, with values. Ram and Sita left for the forest, wearing tree bark, sleeping on the ground, eating roots, and they were so happy. <laughs> Ram and Sita were talking to each other in Chitrakut that these are the happiest days of our lives. It's so simple and so meaningful. And they had such beautiful relationship with different sadhus and sages and yogis and people of the forest. Meanwhile, Bharat, the brother of Ram, the whole exile was staged just so Bharat could be the king instead of Ram. And everything went well. Bharat wasn't he there at the time. He knew nothing about it. But when he came back, he was so upset, he rejected the kingdom. He told those who staged this conspiracy that I am going to the forest, I will stay there for the 14 years in place of Ram, and I will bring Ram back. And he went to the forest with all the royalty and all the sages 
and they had all the, the paraphernalia to coronate Ram as the king. And they met him in the forest. And when Bharat saw Ram living like a hermit, he wept. The two of them embraced. The place where they embraced is still there in Chitrakoot Hill. Bharat begged him to return. But Ram, he refused. He said, Bharat, I wish you all good fortune. I'm very happy you're going to be the king. From my heart, I'm very happy. <laughs> but I must stay here for the purpose of dharma, for the purpose of morality and values. If I compromise, then what am I teaching the world? We cannot compromise on our values. That is integrity. That is greatness. When will our society respect and honor people for their integrity rather than what they have or what they look like? That is human evolution. There are practically chapters of arguments between Bharat and Ram. Ram wants to stay in the forest and Bharat be king, and Bharat wants to stay in the forest and Ram be king. Where do we see this kind of competition? Definitely not in politics. <laughs> They both concerned so much for each other. And ultimately, Bharat had to go back. But you know what he did for 14 years? He ruled the kingdom with just the same integrity and values as Ram did. And everybody loved him. But he stayed in a little straw hut just outside the kingdom in a place called Nandigram. And he wore tree bark. And his hair got matted. And he only ate roots. Because he didn't want to rule the kingdom with anything more than Ram was having. That was their respect for each other. In the Ramayan, there was someone named Ram. Ravana. Ravana was the personification of evil, greed, envy. He kidnapped Sita in the forest and took to his island, which was then Sri Lanka. And Ram was searching for her. He was willing to have a war to protect her. He gave his life for the well-being of Sita. Jatayu was a very great person. He fought Ravana to get Sita back. Jataya was really old. Ram was far away. Sita told Jatayu, don't try to fight. You're too old. Just tell Ram where, where I have been taken. But Jatayu could not stand back. He fought with all of his strength. But he didn't have a chance. He was totally defeated. But in his defeat, later on he was laying on the ground and Ram came and was weeping with love for him, embraced him. Because of what you have done for my sake, there is no one more dear to me in the entire creation. I promise you on this day, the supreme liberation.
Ravana won the battle, but later on, he was destroyed and he lost everything. Chitayu lost the battle, but he attained the highest perfection of life. So who won? And then there's the story of Hanuman. Hanuman, everything he did, he was victorious in his battle against Ravana and everybody else. But actually, <coughs> Chatayu and Hanuman got the exact same benefits, the same blessings. They were both equally victorious, although on the physical level, one won and one lost. What is this teaching giving to the world? The Bhagavad Gita tells, Krishna speaks, we should not be attached to success or failure, honor or dishonor, victory or defeat, pleasure or pain. These dualities are coming and going no matter what we do. We should try to perform our duty the best we possibly can, whether we're in finance or business or agriculture or education or religion. We should try with all of our heart to accomplish, but with integrity, with values. Our true success is how we sustain our values. Our true success is how we please God. The essence of dharma or religion is to love God. and to serve with compassion. To earn with integrity, to serve and spend with compassion. The Bhagavad Gita teaches life beyond borders. In its deepest sense is to connect to who we really are. We are the living force that's animating and witnessing everything within our life. Are we eyes or are we seeing through our eyes? Are we ears or are we hearing through our ears? Are we the heart or are we loving through the heart, thinking through the brain? feeling through the skin. The Bhagavad Gita teaches that we are the Atma. We are that living force. We are the light, that spiritual light that illuminates our whole body with consciousness. The difference between a living body and a dead body, according to the Gita, is the presence of of the true self, the soul. This is a universal principle. In the Bible it is said, what profiteth a person who, gets, who gains the whole world but loses their own soul? The Atma is by nature ananda. It is full of happiness. The intrinsic nature of the true self is unmotivated, uninterrupted, pure love. Love for God. The Bhagavad Purana tells when you water the root of a tree, the water naturally extends to every part of the tree. The leaves, the branches, the twigs. When we actually connect to that deepest potential that we all have to love God, then that love naturally extends to all living beings. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni chaiva swabhakicha pandita samadarshana. 
When I first heard this verse from the Bhagavad Gita, this was 45 years ago, I thought this is what I'm really looking for. Because I was a teenager in the 1960s and I really wanted to see change. I was disgusted with racism and prejudice and, re and, and, and greed and hypocrisy. And then I heard this verse, yes, this is, this is what I want in my life more than anything. Would you like to hear the translation? Krishna tells in Gita, the nature of one who is in touch with their soul the nature of someone who is actually connected to God. It's not a matter of calling oneself a Hindu or a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or a Jain or a Sikh or a Buddhist or a Zoroastrian or whatever else. Actual dharma, actual religion is when we see every living being with equal vision. When we understand our own soul as being a part of God, we can recognize that same living force, the nature of the soul in everyone. And the Gita tells, one sees with equal vision whether one's a high priest or a sinful person, whether one is a black or white or red or yellow or brown or male or female or rich or poor or from one religion or no religion whether one is a human or a elephant or a cow or a dog or a cat I know people who love their dogs or cats as their family members. I grew up with a dog. He was a little dog, a schnauzer. <laughs> and he lived 15 years, so practically my whole life. I was in London on my way to India when I, got a, when I called my mother and she said that he died. But all my life. And he was the most popular person in the family. He's the only one that everyone got along with. <laughs> and if he was in pain, we cried. What is it? Because we were connected in a personal way with that living force within him. We could feel for him. When, there's when that spiritual love awakens in our heart, we will feel compassion for all beings. We may have to take justice for those who are exploiting others, but it's with compassion, it's not with hate. You see, it's impossible for darkness to exist in the presence of light. It's impossible for hate to exist in the presence of love. These are some of the lessons that Ram taught when he was in the forest. And after 14 years when he returned on this dark night, All the hundreds and thousands of citizens of Ayodhya, they were waiting all that time. They loved him. Every moment was like years in separation from him. And he came back at night. And every man, woman, child, of all various vocations, they all 
had a little lamp of fire to welcome Ram back. The whole city was illuminated. That illumination didn't come from the sun or the moon. The illumination came from everyone connected for the same purpose. Hundreds and thousands of little lamps. Each lamp is very small, but when they're all together, it lights up the sky even more than the sun. That's a lesson. What is that lamp? That lamp is each and every one of our gratitude, love, compassion, our values. When we share the same higher purpose together. Whether our lamp is very tiny or a little bigger, it's our unity that can actually light the world. I often tell a little story of the redwood forest. The trees are the biggest trees on earth. And they are, some of them, 1,000, 2,000 years old. But in the place that they grow, there's, there's been dozens of earthquakes over the millenniums, massive storms. They grow on hills with very loose soil. How do they survive these blizzards, these windstorms, these earth, earthquakes? Because underground, the nature of the redwood tree is the roots grow outward just underground, reaching for the roots of another. And when they touch each other, they wrap around and make a permanent embrace. Every tree is directly or indirectly holding up every other tree. Unity is their strength. Even in the greatest reversals, they all grow higher and higher and bigger and bigger toward the sky. When we share that inner light with each other, when we make that decision for that inner transformation ourselves and share it among ourselves, we could really enlighten society. I'd like to give a simple example that's very special to myself and to my dear brother Shamsundar. This year is the 50th anniversary of when our spiritual teacher Srila Prabhupada got on a cargo ship to leave Calcutta for the Western world. On August, Friday the 13th, 1965, he got on this old beaten up cargo ship. Where he was going, he knew no one. He had 40 rupees, which at that time was equivalent to $7. And actually, he, he couldn't exchange it when he came to America because no one wanted rupees in 1965. He crossed three oceans, several continents, 
38 days at sea. He had two heart attacks, constant seasickness. He was 70 years old. In a dock for cargo ships, he walked down and he didn't know anybody. For some time he lived in the Bowery. For some time he met someone who gave him a little room with no windows, no bathroom. He didn't want to take anything. He wanted to give something. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up. He had determination, he had enthusiasm, but it was based on compassion. It was based on hope from a higher power than himself. And today, from, what, from that humble beginning, there's about 600 temples besides Antarctica on every continent of the world. Hundreds of millions of his books have been distributed. When he was in the Bowery, he was trying to translate Bhagavad Gita. And he practically finished it. And then someone broke in his room and stole his little hand typewriter and the manuscript. Now he's 71 years old. Most people would say, it's gone. It was years of work. He just said, well, I guess I just have to start over again. And he did. And hundreds of millions of those Bhagavad Gita's have been given out. It was impossible, but he had hope and faith in a higher power. And he would not compromise his values or his integrity. These types of examples have Shamsundar, he was so inspired. In 1969, this gentleman who's sitting in the front row, Sham Sundar, he saw Prabhupada's incredible enthusiasm, determination, and nothing's impossible. At that time, in 1969, who do you think the most popular people in the world were? They were called the Beatles. And they lived in London, and they were probably the most difficult people to meet in the world. They didn't even do any public performances for years. So Sham Sundar wrote to Srila Prabhupada and said, I'd like to go to London and try to reach the Beatles. And Prabhupada said, that's a good idea. <laughs> he had no money. To get in England in those days was not easy. I know in 1970, just a year later, when I came here, I was harassed and threatened for about five hours at the border when I came on a boat from Holland. They were threatening to cut my hair. They were threatening to put me in prison. They were threatening to export me. And they assured me I wouldn't get in the country. And I was just sitting there really scared. And I prayed, what else can you do? And then they just stamped my passport and pushed me out and said, "If we're watching you. And that's how I got in. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I'm, I'm very happy I'm speaking at Ernst and Young. <laughs> But Sham Sundar comes the same way. He had nothing. Somehow or other he got in. He was living in little warehouse floors with his, with his wife and baby child, Malati and Saraswati. But he was inspired. His leader set an example. 
if we really want to show compassion to others and we really just with that faith, with that willingness, not attached to success or failure, but really trying for success. Krishna, the name that we use for God, is explained Bhava Grahi Janardana. God doesn't see what we do as much as why we do it. What is our love? What is our compassion? What is our values? Within a month, Sham Sundar and the people he came with, just four others, five others, they were living in the house of John Lennon. And George Harrison was so inspired by their singing, he said, let's make a record. Hare Krishna Mantra, it was the number one song in Europe. And then they were on television all over Europe, top of the pops and all these different shows. People were coming for autographs wherever they were. <laughs> because they were touched by a person's compassion. They weren't doing it for themselves. What is leadership? What is the message we want to give to our children and to the world? A message that for our own selfish purposes, we can pollute, we can exploit, we can lie, we can cheat, we can betray. If that's what we do, that's the standard we set for all those who look up to us. Or are we going to show that there's nothing higher than integrity? There's nothing higher than coming in contact with our own divinity, with our own light, the light of love. And in whatever we do, whether farmers or industrialists, politicians or swamis, education, educators, or scientists, whatever it may be. Sam Sudhir Hari Toshanam. If we do it as an expression of the joy that we have found within our own heart, the joy of love, the joy of compassion, then we give light to the world. And in that way, Sham Sundar's testimony of his life. Nothing's really impossible. We can overcome apparent impossible situations for very greedy, selfish, arrogant purposes or with love and compassion. That is Diwali. To help us to really focus on sharing the light and joy of our hearts. There's a saying, if you lose your wealth, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. If you lose your values and character, you lose everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Radnaut Sami. Um, I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Does anyone have any questions?
Hare Krishna. Um, I, I have a question which is about, um, you, you mentioned love for God. So is it right to say that, would it be right to say that God is separate from us or that God is, is us, so we, God, God and I are the same? Um, <laughs> Both. <laughs> in our in our Bhagavad philosophy, in the Gita tells Mamaivam so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana that we are all part of God. We are all children of God. The example is given of the sun. There's the sun planet and there are sun rays. Achintya beda beda tattva, unity and diversity, simultaneous oneness and variegatedness. If a sun ray comes into this room, we will say it's the sun. But is it the sun? It is, but it isn't. It's a part of the sun. The sun ray is always coming from the sun. The sun never comes from the sun ray. There are limitless sun rays, but there's one sun. And all sun rays are emanating from the same sun. So similarly, we are like that sun ray. We have the same qualities as Bhagavan or God, Satchit Ananda. We are eternal, we are full of knowledge, and we are full of bliss. But God is the supreme source of everything, and we are always subordinate to that supreme source. On the path of bhakti, which we follow, we do not want to become God. We want to love God. We want to be grateful to God. Because beyond God's almighty, powerful, creative nature is infinite sweetness, infinite beauty, infinite love. To love God and to feel God's unlimited love is the nature of the soul. But somehow or other, like a dream, we've forgotten our true nature in our relationship and we're thinking, I'm man, I'm woman, I'm black, white, red, yellow, I'm so many other things, I'm one religion, other religion, and we're fighting over so many differences. The Gita tells, Bhoktaram Jagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwara, that if we want to actually find peace, we understand everything is the property of the Supreme. Nothing is ours. Proprietorship means control. Ultimately, at the time of death, what can we take with us? In India, at the funeral pyre, they put a white sheet over the body. It has no pockets. Doesn't matter who we are, what our bank account is, we can't take anything with us. Everything belongs to the Creator. Everything belongs to the Supreme Beloved. Our intelligence, our abilities, our wealth, our property, our we are caretakers. When we honor the role with gratitude and humility that we are caretakers, then we could be billionaires and we'll make a tremendous positive difference in the world. Or we may just be little villagers and we make a great difference in the world. In the story of Ram, they were building a bridge across an ocean and Hanuman was lifting mountains. And as he was lifting the mountain to put to make the bridge, there was a little squirrel that was in front of him. And the squirrel jumped in the ocean and then came out and rolled in sand and just shook his body and put little sand. 
Now what's the difference between a few grains of sands and a mountain to make a step for the bridge? Hanuman was carrying the mountain, the squirrel was pushing sand, and Ram told Hanuman, he's doing just as much as you. Because he's doing everything he can do for that higher purpose of love and seva, service, and you are doing the same. They're equal. So when we recognize that light of God's grace that's within us, we can recognize it in others. And we can utilize whatever we have for that higher purpose. And that's seva. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much, Samiji. Thank you very much, Radhanath Swami. We could all please okay. show our thanks with a round of applause. Okay. Um, just while I allow our team to set the stage up for the next part of our evening, I noticed someone had their hand up over there. Did you want to share something or? Uh, it was more a question to the uh, okay. um, but Don't worry, I hear we're, we're well we could, you a can slight ask slight time issue. You so can ask a question whilst we set up. Uh, um, yeah, if, if, will he have time to respond? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm I've got a more s sort of serious question to ask, and that is, in light of recent events, uh, you've talked about leaders and how we hope they show more compassion. If you were Francois Hollande right now, how would you demonstrate more compassion uh, uh, by doing things slightly differently to solve the problems that are facing uh, that, that current leader of France? Thanks. That's a really easy question. <laughs> we all have our roles. And <clears throat> the history of the world is often that we try to solve a problem but if we don't do it with the right wisdom and values of seeing the larger picture, sometimes the solution to a problem creates a much bigger problem than the original problem. Yes? And perhaps that's what's happening today. We solve one problem, it creates another problem that's worse than the original problem. We try to solve that problem, it creates another problem. That's so you know, we have to really have some wisdom and some, some sensitivity and some, some values. And certainly, compassion doesn't mean just allowing terrorism or cruelty to go unpunished. Compassion means to protect the innocent as well. Very much so. So there's militaries in this world, there's political leaders in this world, and then there's you and me in this world. <laughs> and what's important is that we're not doing to exploit, we're doing to actually protect. And when leaders sincerely and genuinely are coming together with, with an actual detached from our own selfish political interests, and we're actually doing it with genuine concern, compassion, and good, good understanding, moral and spiritual, and we could work together to make some real solutions in all these different situations. <coughs> the, 
the test of one who loves God is humility, compassion, and the, the capacity to actually offer respect to others. In Sanskrit, there's a beautiful verse, Paradukha Dukhi, that one who actually is connected to God, they will see others' happiness as their happiness, and others' pain as their pain. Spirituality is not a sectarian idea. Years ago, and I write about this in my book, I was living on the bank of the Ganges, and there was an 85-year-old man who I made good friends with. He was a Hindu, and every day he would take me to his best friend's x-ray clinic. He was a Muslim. One's name was Narayan, the other was Muhammad. Muhammad would discuss the Quran, Narayan would discuss the Ramayana and the Gita, and I would discuss whatever I was learning. There was so much love and affection and respect and sharing. And one day I asked Narayan, when we were alone on the bank of the river, how is it in a country where Hindus and Muslims are in so much conflict, the two of you are best friends? He smiled, a really serious smile. And his answer, I'm still citing today, 45 years later. He said, a dog will recognize his master any way the master dresses. The master might be in a suit and tie, might be in a t-shirt, might be in bathing suit, maybe naked. The dog recognizes. If we cannot recognize our God, when he comes in a different dress, at a different time throughout history, to show his kindness and give his message to others, if we cannot recognize our God in other religions, then we have so much to learn from the dogs. It's important that we clean the ecology of our own hearts so that we could really, our decisions in whatever particular role we may be in, that our decisions together are actually you know, paving the way for light, not just more darkness. I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but yeah, that's all. That, that's the only thing I know how to talk about, actually. <laughs> but it's very, it's very sad. Hate in the name of a loving God. It has nothing to do with God. Such arrogance in whatever religion it may come, has nothing to do with God. And to protect the innocent and to stop, we need a good, a good plan. A good plan that's actually going to resolve this difficulty and in the end make a world a better place. Which is something that we're not so good at doing these days in this world. But a revolution of consciousness is required. Thank you.